Good morning. Can I please ask you all to stand up? Uh, people, people who have talked with me yesterday during breaks and other moments knew that this would be coming, and other people have no clue what will be happening. Uh, the king, no. Some people have been, uh, some people have been uh, tasting some of our uh, intangible cultural heritage yesterday, and I wanted to see uh, what the effects were of this. Uh, but I see that most people can stand. Right and, and still again, so that seems okay. No, one of, one of the statements I want to be making is I want to break with the idea, and it's also part of our heritage, that everything important happens while seated. Uh, and so this is a very weird idea, it's also very unhealthy. Uh, that's why uh, people who are presenting can always stand, they have the luxury, they can always sit, but people who have to uh, listen, they have to sit. And I was very glad also yesterday that people voluntarily would stand up and also stretch their legs. A bit. So I have done that part of the job. You can sit again if you want, you can also stand, uh, it's totally up to you. Good. Uh, what is an anthropologist? a social, cultural anthropologist, as I am doing here. Well, times have changed. My predecessors had a task to uh, roam around in rainforests, uh, observing exotic tribes. Times have changed. I'm here observing you. Uh, not to say that you are not exotic, uh, and that this uh, building is not exotic, uh, but it's indicating that uh, times have changed and that anthropologists are uh, observing many different things. And I'm certainly not the only anthropologist who is involved in heritage or who is studying people who deal with heritage. Uh, I have colleagues who do that in very interesting ways. Uh, but I will <laughs> come back also to the, the history of anthropology, but one of the things uh, I must confess is that yesterday afternoon I was, as the, the day was drawing to a close, I was preparing my notes and I was very happy I had a very nice outline of, of what I would be saying here. And then my dear colleague Christine Kutma started talking and I became very stressed because she started mentioning things that I had already on my list so I crossed it off. And again, another point that I had on my list, I crossed it off. And so, yeah. Um, so I had, a, I had a dilemma and I think uh, the meal and the drinks uh, brought a solution so I became less stressed uh, and I started realizing that it's maybe good that there is overlap because it points to things that people with different expertise uh, know here and so it's maybe good that there is overlap and so there will be overlap and I will also be repeating some things but uh, taking my hang on. Uh, one of the, the first things that I want to say that, uh, that became very clear to me as I was listening to uh, the different presentations is that um, I became aware again of something that I have realized, but it was very strongly present yesterday too, is that heritage is a discourse. Uh, and if you are not familiar with that discourse and you would have been here in the audience, uh, you would have been quite lost. Uh, because uh, there's a whole discourse that has been developed around heritage uh, and that, as Christine pointed out also, that uh, we, people who are maybe familiar with heritage, take for granted. But maybe we should question that, uh, the categories and all the things that are being used. And as I was um, trying to prepare and also trying to justify why I was here, I actually found on my computer the text that I wrote last year and I didn't remember that I had written this. Uh, and let me read just uh, one paragraph. It's basically explaining what the link is between anthropology and heritage and also how anthropologists have been very upset and, and very involved also in actually trying to shape and manipulate things at, at UNESCO level. Uh, and so to understand that we have to go back a little bit in, in history. Uh, the start of UNESCO and the fact that anthropologists were very involved from the very start in uh, having their say and how that has also frustrated them. So because its headquarters are in Paris, UNESCO has been influenced perhaps disproportionately by the French intellectual tradition. And this is important because uh, 
nothing is innocent, and so the fact that things are based in a certain place has consequences, and this is also the case here. During the first decades, UNESCO collaborated regularly with Paris-based anthropologists, such as uh, Michel Leris or Claude Lévi-Strauss. Jacques Goody regularly crossed the channel to give advice. He was one among many anthropologists who helped UNESCO broaden its narrow concept of heritage at that time to include what came to be known in heritage <coughs> discourse as intangible cultural heritage, but what many anthropologists would simply call culture. And so this is something to think about. Other key players included Nestor Garcia Canclini from Mexico, Manuela Carneiro da Cunha from Brazil, Junzo Kawada from Japan, and George Econominas from France. Major steps were taken at the end of the 1990s, and you see that many years passed to, to make things move on and develop. When Mexican anthropologist Lourdes Arispe, who is now the UNESCO Chair in Research on Intangible Cultural Heritage and Cultural Diversity, was UNESCO Assistant Director General for Culture. So that was from 1994 until 1998. And so I'm mentioning all these names and these things to actually point out that uh, the fact that we are here, the fact that we are talking and using certain discourse and, and thinking in certain ways is all not a coincidence. It's, it's different players that were at the right or at the wrong time in certain places doing things or not doing things. Earlier on, UNESCO had been instrumental in changing the role and idea of heritage from a vehicle of nation building to an instrument of world making. And so this is uh, what was very important at the very beginning and we can actually reflect critically uh, whether we are not actually turning the clock back and whether there are other forces, especially national forces, who are uh, trying very heavily to turn it back and make this, this, nation, uh, this national aspect uh, more important than this world-making. Uh, and so maybe destroying a bit this agenda of UNESCO to create a global cosmopolitan awareness and identity. So you have these different forces uh, that are at stake. The official shift happened in 1978 with the founding of the World Heritage Committee and World Heritage List, both results from the 1972 Convention concerning the protection of the world's cultural and natural heritage. The rationale prompting that convention basically reiterated laments made by Claude Lévi-Strauss 20 years before that date regarding the safeguarding of cultural diversity. It would take another quarter of a century and lots of pressure by non-Western scholars, particularly from Japan, but also from other places, before the 2003 Convention for the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage was put in place. Just to uh, point out that if things change, they apparently change slowly. So if you want to change things, you have to have lots of patience. Uh, but so this, this as a preface to actually uh, start my, my reflections on the things that I observed yesterday. So this discourse that is uh, all present and the fact that we all use uh, the same terminology which gives us the impression and maybe the false impression that we are all talking about the same things. And so that's the question. Are we talking about the same things because we use the same language? Because before there was a, a standardized language to talk about heritage there were many different contexts, contexts and maybe many different ways to uh, organize and to categorize uh, heritage. And the question is, what have we gained and what have we lost? We have ob obviously gained things, but we may also have lost things. Uh, and so yesterday there were references and also criticisms and reflections <coughs> on, on discourse in, in a couple of ways. I think uh, about Mark Jacobs and his uh, frustration with the community or the community's uh, concept and the fact that this is very essentialized and you know, the reality is, is more complex. But you see that from the moment the discourse is installed because it's present in official documents, uh, people start using it and it's very hard to go against it. Uh, it takes a lot of energy to uh, go against uh, the discourse and things that are being used. And also in, in the in, in tourism, this community uh, concept is being used, community-based tourism, and there have been published dozens of articles criticizing it, but it's, still, it's the discourse, so people use it. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's frustrating. Um, 
But one of the things that was uh, clearly revealed also yesterday that even if there is a discourse and even if you think it's, it's all clear and have the, the categories as, as UNESCO is using them, I think we have uh, clearly seen and also the case studies that were presented to us that heritage is complex and multi-layered and that sometimes these boxes and categories uh, don't serve uh, the realities on the ground all that well. And one of the things that uh, categorizations are doing, and this is also something that Christine point, pointed out, is the fact that it's, uh, it's leaving out things and it's also leaving out connections that are there, but because of the putting in boxes are being left out. And so one of the things that is very striking is uh, uh, the very clear link because of the discourse between intangible heritage and culture, so intangible cultural heritage. And so what do we do with, with natural heritage and <coughs> intangible aspects of natural heritage? And the fact that uh, because of the boxes we don't make these connections also means that yesterday nobody talks, of, talks about this because it doesn't fit in our box uh, system. And so this is something that we should be thinking about because of course all these things are related and uh, you have to be blind to not notice the relevance of uh, things that are happening to our natural environment. I mean, it's constantly in use and it's also heavily related to heritage. Uh, and so, but because of our boxes, maybe we don't give it the attention that it deserves. And so this is something that we should be thinking about uh, critically. Then, uh, this is of course due to the, the specific aim of uh, why, why you are here is this link between uh, ICH and museums and ICH it, and it sounds uh, to me very funny, ICH H, aging things, heritage uh, I actually like the, the the Flemish acronym also quite a bit, it's ICE it's just ICE it's, uh, it's simple uh, but as I said yesterday jokingly so uh, from the moment we, we start using too many acronyms, then there's something uh, quite wrong with, with the way we are dealing with, with heritage. And so uh, I will also be looking and listening today to how many acronyms you dare to use. Uh, but to talk about this link between ICH and, and museums, uh, when I started uh, listening yesterday and, and hearing the very different contexts and realities, I was of course immediately uh, thinking of the situation in in Belgium, where uh, if Belgium would have a Facebook uh, page, it would put on its status, uh, it's complicated. Uh, and this is also the relation between ICH and museums, it's complicated. It depends a lot on context variables and uh, lots of different things, and it's, it's maybe hard to see uh, where the issues are, because the issues in different places may be very different, and it's related to things that we have talked about like the issue of scales, uh, the issues of, of uh, policies, the supporting policies that are there or not there, uh, or wrongly there, uh, so the different uh, national contexts, local contexts, regional contexts, different types of museums with uh, context and object matters that maybe lend themselves more easily to make this link or, or, or not make this link. Um, and I think the conclusion of all this was actually given at the very beginning of the day. If you listened very carefully, Sergio uh, uh, one of the first speakers, he actually uh, gave, I think, the, the brilliant summary, and it's that the relation between ICH and museums is, it's not love at first sight, but it's a marriage of convenience. And I think that's a very good way of, of putting it, whether you like it, or not, it's very strategic to actually uh, see this link and actually reinforce this link, just purely also out of, of strategic uh, reasons. And uh, the not love at first sight is something that is also very present when you think about uh, ICH museums versus tourism. Uh, tourism is another thing that also, and people who are dealing with, with heritage have a very ambiguous relation with tourism and tourists, and this is something that no, it's a bit despised and it's not. And, and this was also a comment that was given yesterday. So in all these presentations yesterday, the lack of a focus of taking into consideration of visitors. 
So if we are talking about museums, if we're talking about ICH, you know, as visitors, as people who do something with everything that we are proposing to them. Uh, and so where are these people in our analysis? So this, this was quite striking. And it was quite striking because yesterday we heard in, in many uh, statements also that this is important. I don't remember who said it, but it was a statement that ICH is participation of people. So if it is participation of people, then the people should be present all over in, in every presentation and in every reflection. Uh, and the participation of people also brings us to the importance of narrative. Uh, the storytelling. I didn't hear much about storytelling, but it's very important how we package things. Uh, you are here, you are experts, and so you package things differently, but of course if you engage with the public, you have to package things in a rather different way uh, in order to make things understand. And we heard yesterday, I remember when there was a presentation uh, from Switzerland, the power of persuasion which I think is quite important, uh, especially in this day and age where there is a lot of persuasion taking place. I mean, think of social media, think of fake news, think of all kind of things happening. And so whether you like it or not, you have to think very seriously about how you position yourself within this reality of today, which is not the reality of 30 years ago. We live in a very different reality. And so how do you position yourself and your work and the values that you see important? in this link between RCH and, and museums. So how do you make use of all these new possibilities or challenges? Or so, so what do you do with this? Uh, because you often hear when you talk to, to people who are not in heritage and heritage sector, this idea, whether it's true or not, but there's this idea that heritage is not the most sexy thing in the world. It's, it's, it has this ring to it that it's, you know, it's, it's as boring and uh, as, as the oldest that it would refer to and this is, a, this is not my perception but this is a perception of many people and so uh, this poses a lot of ethical dilemmas too do you have to make heritage and heritage discourse and the way you package things more sexy or cool uh, and what are the dangers of doing that uh, because uh, your risk of making the, the meeting much more important than the message. Uh, and so reflections on, on uh, these types of things are quite uh, important, I think. And uh, the many challenges, it's very clear that there are quite a bit of challenges and that uh, we will not move forward if we stick uh, within our own boxes and if we stick having discussions with uh, people who are heritage experts and if, if there is something that I learned uh, yesterday from observing yesterday's is, and I wrote it down, creativity will save the day. Uh, I saw yesterday some very creative things and it was not a coincidence that these creative things were also presented by people who, who have feet in different areas and fields and who are not uh, easily classifiable in boxes because they think outside the box and they also move outside their boxes. And we have heard <coughs> in different presentations references to this. I've written down uh, the importance of creating crossroads, creating shared spaces, uh, unplanned approaches. And how do you uh, how do you facilitate unplanned approaches? And how do you make that pass uh, with policymakers? It's quite, uh, it's quite a challenge. Uh, also the link between heritage and art, this artistic process, and, and we have seen examples of this. Uh, think of the examples of uh, the Zeneke parade and everything around it in Brussels, also the last example of the African Museum. Uh, and I want to maybe close also with uh, what Milan said when she was talking about the Zeneke parade, and this is actually quite important. Uh, that the whole basis of the Zeneca project is uh, having a very good understanding of what is going on in the city, but I would say of what is going on outside the world of heritage experts. So keeping in touch with people, have a very good feeling of what is moving in society, and that allows you much better to then position yourself and see how actually 
your expertise and your values and the things that you find important in this link between ICH and museums can actually maybe help to answer some of the questions that that society has, and then it's it's a matter of finding also the right way of communicating that. But uh, I see here the moderator doing a very good job and pointing out that I have to stop now. So that's what I'm doing. <laughs>